you have your Bibles this morning, can you please turn to Genesis chapter 45? Uh, while you're turning there, uh, this may be the last Sunday or the second last Sunday that we have Brother Gabby with us from PNG. And so just like to say farewell, brother, and all the best to you. It's been a blessing to be able to have fellowship with you and uh, make sure that you say farewell to Brother Gabby as he goes. Uh, he will be flying all over the place from now on and we look forward to seeing what the Lord does with you. So praise the Lord. Let's go to Genesis chapter 45. And we're continuing with the story of Joseph that we've been looking at on Sunday mornings. Last week, we finally let the brothers in on the secret that the official they'd been dealing with in Egypt was in fact their brother Joseph. And so now we read about uh, the consequences and the ongoing relationship. So Genesis chapter 45, and we're going to read verses 16 through 24. <clears throat> and the fame thereof, that's of telling the brothers the truth, was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brethren are come. And it pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, this do ye. Laid your beasts, and go get ye unto, Can unto the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households, and come unto me. And I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and you shall eat the fat of the land. Now thou art commanded, this do ye. Take your wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones, and, and for your wives, and bring your father, and come. Also regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. And the children of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh, and gave them provision for the way. To all of them he gave each man changes of raiment, but to Benjamin he gave three hundred pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. And to his father he sent after this manner, ten asses laden with the good things of Egypt, and ten she-asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. So he sent his brethren away, and they departed, and he said unto them, See that ye fall not out by the way. Let's pray, and we'll commit our time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for our time that we can uh, already remember the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can come and set that most notable sacrifice uh, foremost in our minds. Uh, we ask now that you would help us, Lord, as believers. As followers of Christ, help us to submit ourselves to the Word of God and help us to want to be all that you want us to be through the ministry of the Word of God to our hearts. Uh, we pray that today the Word of God would speak clearly to us, help us to understand and help us to be able to take these words and to live them. We thank you, Father, for this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. The revelation of Joseph to his brothers was more than just a family issue. We read that the fame thereof, uh, the noise, was heard in Pharaoh's house. And so the grapevine was working well in the house of Pharaoh. And news of what had happened in Joseph's family, that the brothers had turned up in Egypt, travelled all the way to the top. And Pharaoh himself heard the news. Now it pleased Pharaoh, and it, it pleased Pharaoh's servants to hear that Joseph's brethren were come. It pleased Pharaoh well and his servants to hear the news. Now, I'm sure that the presence of foreign relatives in Egypt probably wouldn't have stirred Pharaoh very often. Uh, to hear that Joe Bloggs down the street had his brother visiting from over in Syria probably wasn't a matter for Pharaoh to consider. But because it was Joseph's family, Pharaoh was quite interested and Pharaoh was pleased Joseph had shown himself to be a wise spokesman for God and he had shown himself to be a responsible coordinator of the famine relief efforts already in Egypt. Have a look back in Genesis chapter 41. Uh, we find in verses 38 to 40 of Genesis 41, Pharaoh's estimation of the man Joseph, just from a brief meeting. Genesis 41 verse 38. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is? A man in whom the Spirit of God is. So Pharaoh thinks he's unique. 
he thinks he's spiritual. Verse 39, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And so with the years of plenty over, and Egypt well prepared now for the years of famine that had already begun, Pharaoh is obviously grateful for having Joseph around. And I think this gratefulness towards Joseph explains to us why Pharaoh is so pleased to hear the news that oh, Joseph's brethren have shown up in Egypt. And so these brethren were shown the grace of Pharaoh. Uh, they experienced blessings from Pharaoh's hand. Not because, ben, not because uh, Pharaoh particularly liked Simeon or Issachar or Zebulun or any other brothers, but because he had a good relationship with Joseph. Uh, these brothers really cashed in on Pharaoh's favour for their brother Joseph. And now as life begins to turn rosy for the family of Joseph, as things start to turn a corner and they're going to start to experience some real time of plenty, there are two very important reminders for us and for the brothers to take heed of that are in this passage. We're going to have a look at them. These brothers are on the verge of seeing an incredible plan come to pass. They are about to see the end of this wonderful plan. But they could have tainted this plan with the wrong response. They could have very easily missed out on what God was trying to do. And I don't think it will be hard for us to see this morning how these reminders are still essential for us, still important for us, if we don't want to taint those intricate plans that God has in place in our lives. So, first of all, let's have a look at point number one, the overseeing architect. It is a little bit far-fetched for us to think that Pharaoh would care at all for Israel and his children during the time of drought in Egypt. Imagine, just picture with me for a moment, let your imagination go for a moment. Imagine that Jacob, Israel, walked from Canaan or traveled from Canaan all the way down to Egypt and presented himself before Pharaoh in a time of drought with all of his family, children, possessions and so forth, and said to Pharaoh, excuse me, I need to borrow your wagons. I want to live in the best area of your land. I want you to support my family, not just for survival, but I want you to give us all the delicacies of the place and I want you to look after our family. What do you say? Laughter, exactly right. I doubt Pharaoh would have just laughed. I think he probably would have ordered the execution of an insubordinate in his presence. Uh, foreign aid didn't traditionally form a large part of an ancient budget for a world empire. And yet Israel found themselves abundantly blessed by Pharaoh. We read in Genesis 45 verses 17 and 18, if you flip back over to where we are today. Genesis 45 verses 17 and 18. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, say unto thy brethren, this do ye. Laid your beasts and go, get you unto the land of Canaan and take your father and your households and come unto me and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt and ye shall eat the fat of the land. So Pharaoh invites Israel's family, who he hasn't met by the way, he invites his family to live within Egypt to live under the protection of the Egyptians in a time of famine. He offers to provide them with the best of the land. It says, I will give unto you the good of the land of Egypt, not just the scraps. And ye shall eat the fat of the land. Now, the fat isn't just the offcuts. You might think of the fat of the steak as the not so good bits. But what Pharaoh is saying is, I will give you the juicy parts of Egypt. I will give you the best of our delicacies. I will give you the proper portion that should be given to a person of honour. 
And so he provides them with not merely a ration of survival, but with a great blessing for coming to live in Egypt. We read in verse 19 then, Now thou art commanded, this was Pharaoh's commandment to Joseph, this do ye, this is what Joseph was to command his brothers, take you wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. So Pharaoh tells Joseph, go and get the Egyptian wagons and send them back to pick up your family and all of your possessions and ride into Egypt in Egyptian wagons. It's a pretty good ride. Verse 20, also regard not your stuff for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. If you're moving to a new house, that house is either furnished or unfurnished. If it's an unfurnished house, you have to bring all of your stuff and fill up the house with your own stuff. If it's a furnished house, you don't have to worry about your stuff. You can just move in and enjoy all of everybody else's stuff, which is great, especially if the person is the king of Egypt. He's got pretty good stuff, if I can put it that way. This is like Pharaoh saying to Israel's family, come to Egypt for an all expenses paid five star stay through the famine. This is much more than just permission for Israel and his family to live. It's a royal welcome from an incredible nation. And this was all made possible through the prior arrival of Joseph into Egypt. This is how God did it. And we know that because in Genesis 45 and verse 17, it says, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren. The reason that Pharaoh was talking here is because these were the brothers of Joseph. Uh, I'm going to give them this blessing because they're related to you, Joseph. And this is a way that I can show my gratitude to you. It was only because they were a part of Joseph's family that they enjoyed these blessings. Joseph earned the favour of Pharaoh and there was considerable cost for Joseph in earning that favour. But, so that we don't stop at Joseph, we recognise Joseph's part in the plan, but we have to also recognise the fact that this was not Joseph's plan. Joseph didn't know that his time in Egypt was going to result in his family being able to come for this sort of a treatment under the hand of Pharaoh. In fact, Joseph didn't even know he was going to Egypt. Joseph had already told his brothers who was responsible for the outcome of all of these actions. Back in Genesis 45, verses 5 to 7. When the brothers realize or they're told that it's Joseph, it says in Genesis 45 verse 5, Now therefore, Joseph says to his brothers, Be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me hither into Egypt. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years, in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. You see, it was God who wanted to save the family of Jacob. God had a plan to save the children of Israel, to keep the family of Israel alive. And it is truly amazing to see Pharaoh thinking he's acting out of his own goodwill towards Joseph, carrying out the grand plans of the great architect that he planned all that way ago before Joseph ever stepped foot into Egypt. God has his way, while Pharaoh thinks he's having his way. Amazing to see. Joseph and Pharaoh were simply the instruments that God used to carry out his plan. And here's our first reminder. There is a master designer. There is a grand architect. And he works hard. He's at work in every part of our world. He has all sorts of different plans. And he makes sure that everything that he starts, everything that he determines will come to pass. He makes sure that it will. 
Now, unlike council plans, God's plans are not released to inform the public, apart from those that are recorded in the Word. God's plans are not released to seek public interest or public comment. Imagine that. But God's plans are established plans. They're not plans that He just makes up as He goes along. They're plans that God has in place and that God will enact. Now, plans, as we see through the pages of Scripture, they can utilize the most important people in human society, like Pharaoh. Those plans can utilize the most hostile people in human society, like the scribes and chief priests in the days of Jesus. Or those plans can utilize the most plain among us, like a bunch of fishermen around the Sea of Galilee. God has grand designs for the world. And when we see the instruments that he uses, it points us to the fact that there is someone greater than the people that are actually performing this. And God is at work in countless ways in bringing those plans to pass. And brethren, that is a great encouragement to us in a wicked world and in a confusing life. The world is not just a mess. It is messy, (laughs) but it's not just a mess. There are plans that undergird the world and God is still bringing those plans to pass. More personally, your life is not just a mess. Regardless of how people have impacted it or the choices that you've made, your life is not just a mess. God always has a plan for your life from this day forward. Always. Now you might say, but the effects of sin have ruined God's plans in my life. Well, some of the effects of sin may have ruined some of the plans that God had in your life. But the scriptures don't speak of a God whose plans are foiled by sin. The scriptures speak of a God whose plans are sin resistant. And in some cases, they even account for sin occurring. God can still bring his plans to pass. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes we go against God's will and we miss out on things that we could have had in God's will. But don't think that every time we sin, oh, that's it. I can never find the will of God again. God's plans are missed out on and now my life is just a mess. I've just got to figure it out from here. That's not the case. God is too good an architect to be so easily foiled. Let me give you just a few examples. Three. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Now we could go anywhere in this genealogy and prove this point, but this one's the most obvious. Matthew chapter 1 is the account of the people that God had to bring forth the Messiah. Okay, so it's Jesus' ancestors going back through history. We read in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 6, And Jesse begat David the king. That's the David that we all know, the David of David and Goliath. And David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of, of Urias. Who was that? Bathsheba. Okay, so this relationship was a sin. David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband. And yet, God used that exact relationship to bring forth Messiah, to raise Messiah, to have him in the right family. Turn with me to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. Acts chapter 3 and verse 13, it says, The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye, this is speaking to the Jews who are responsible for Jesus' death, whom ye delivered up and denied him, in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed 
the prince of life. That sounds like a way to foil God's plan, doesn't it? To murder the one that God sent to be the savior of the world, but did it? He killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses, and by whom we are saved. Here, God wasn't foiled by sin in the plan of salvation through all the ages. God's too good an architect to be so easily foiled. And then, of course, there's the example that we're looking at this morning, the life of Joseph. We could go to many other examples, but this one's pretty obvious. Let's have a look at Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. This is Joseph speaking to his brothers a little bit later in the story. It says, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. And so there you have three examples of how God had a plan beforehand and people sinned within that plan thinking having a look back on those plans that well does the plan still does the plan still go on can god still bring his purposes to pass when people are sinning all through it well there are three examples how god was able to continue his plan god never plans on sin he never relies upon sin. God always has a perfect way of doing things. But sin does not necessarily ruin God's plan. So sin, whether in other people or in ourselves, when it impacts our lives, it's no reason to give up on the plan of God for our lives. If God's plans were nullified by sin then no plans that involved humans would ever come to pass because we're all sinful. And most of the time we wreck God's plans in some way, uh, we at small or large. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 is a verse that we've gone back to often through the story of Joseph because it's probably the New Testament equivalent of Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. If we want the plans of God to work out for our good, then regardless of others, we as his called children need to love God. That's our responsibility. We need to make sure that we are on the right side of the plans of God, enjoying the blessings of it. And that promises to those who love God and show it through their obedience. God has a plan. We only see the instruments of that plan but God is the architect. Don't be surprised if you don't understand that plan because it's a lot smarter than we are. And when we can't add things up like God is, just remember there's other parts that God understands that we don't. Someone has said, if you can't understand the plans of God, then grant him the privilege of being smarter than you are. Now, it's obvious that God's plans are better than our understanding, let alone our own plans, when we see Pharaoh joyfully inviting Israel and his family to come and live off the riches of Egypt, a miracle. And so, first of all, we saw that there was an overseeing architect, and there's a warning for us to observe that in each of our lives. Second of all, our second point is the oblivious antagonists. Joseph's brothers now head off to Canaan and they take with them the riches of Pharaoh and the favor of their brother. And we see that it wasn't just the gifts of Pharaoh that Joseph takes back to his family. Sorry, that the brothers take back to the family. Joseph also gave them gifts in addition to those that Pharaoh gave. Let's have a look at verses 21 to 23. Genesis 45, 21 to 23, it says that the children of Israel did so. That's they left with those things. And Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh and gave them provision for the way. 
To all of them he gave each man changes of raiment. But to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. And to his father he sent after this manner 10 asses laden with the good things of Egypt and 10 she asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. So Joseph gives them food that will sustain them all the way back to Canaan and then back again to Egypt. But he also gives them changes of raiment. That might be a strange gift for us to give to other people, although sometimes it's done. And this was a very valuable gift in Old Testament times, especially from those who were rulers in countries. They would often keep a cupboard full of pre-arranged outfits, if you will, and they would pass them on to people as a sign of respect. And so he gave two changes of clothing to each of his brothers, except for Benjamin. His gift to Benjamin was more. He gave him 300 pieces of silver and he gave him five changes of raiment. Now, you're probably thinking, because we've been through the story of Joseph, is this favoritism? Because we know it's a problem in the family. Is this favoritism? Well, I don't think that it was favoritism. His gift to Benjamin was different because he and Benjamin were full brothers. They shared a mum and a dad. And he was the only brother that he shared a mother with. That mother was now passed away. But it was a different situation for the other brothers. Maybe it also reflected that Benjamin had suffered in his life. His mum had died. He'd lived most of his life believing, because he probably didn't know what the brothers had done, that his older brother had been killed. Much of Benjamin's life was probably a sad life. And so if Jacob had done this, then we could probably call it favoritism because Jacob was equally related to each of his children. Joseph, on the other hand, was full brother to Benjamin alone. And so there was a different relationship there for these two, certainly in the case when Benjamin had lost so much. Now to his father, Joseph also sent more than just a normal Egyptian official would. And this would help to convince Jacob in the days to come that Joseph was in fact alive and that it wasn't some sort of a trick on the part of the Egyptians. Uh, Good things or delicacies of Egypt and corn, bread and meat that would last for the journey. And so the brothers set off with all of their bounty for the land of Canaan. But as they go... Joseph sends one more thing with them. It's a warning. Verse 24. So he sent his brethren away and they departed. And he said unto them, see that you fall not out by the way. Just stands out, doesn't it? Just a little statement. Just see that you fall not out by the way. Now, just to clarify the English there, this might have been the first time they'd ridden in an Egyptian chariot or an Egyptian wagon, but it's not advice for traveling in a wagon. See that you fall not out by the way. It's a discussion about their relationship with each other, not on vehicle safety. The reasons for this warning were probably threefold. There's probably three reasons. First of all, the old disagreement about what they should have done with Joseph and whose fault it was for Joseph's uh, misfortune had resurfaced during Joseph, in Joseph's presence. Uh, they didn't know that Joseph could understand their language. And as soon as things started to turn bad in times just gone by, the brothers started to blame each other. See, I told you we shouldn't have done that to Joseph. God is judging us for all these things that had happened. So Joseph knew that these contentions between the brothers were there and they could be easily opened again. The second reason why he gave this warning to the brothers is similar and it's relating to pressure because the brothers were going to go home and tell their father, come to Egypt because Joseph said to come. So they were going to have to tell their father the truth. They were going to have to let Jacob in on their hateful plot. And so Joseph, as he sent his brothers off, knowing that they just recently fought about this and knowing that all the way home, they're probably going to be thinking about, oh, what's dad going to do? He didn't want the blame game. 
or those old tensions to ruin the reconciliation that was in the past now. He'd made things right with his brothers and he didn't want him to go backwards. Now, the fact that Joseph, the one most affected by their sin, told them not to argue about it would certainly have helped. Now, even though Reuben wasn't in on the plan to sell him and he was probably planning to come back and rescue Joseph a little bit later out of the pit, uh, even Reuben who had things to argue and say, well, look, I wasn't going to do this. Why did you do this? If Joseph could say, don't argue about this, and not even Reuben could have brought it up. If Joseph has moved on, then we shouldn't fall out on this. We shouldn't have a falling out. Joseph was an example of forgiveness. Now, a possible third reason, although it's probably not the case, is what I mentioned before, the possibility they could get jealous of Benjamin for those extra gifts that he received. Now, I don't think this would have been a big issue because they would have seen Benjamin's lot and Benjamin's relationship to both his mother and his brother. And so Joseph warned them not to fall out with each other. He probably saw that disunity among the brethren could endanger this last step of God's plan. God had engineered everything to bring Israel down to Egypt. And he'd done really the hardest bits. Getting Joseph to Egypt, getting, seeing Joseph faithfully through all those parts, getting Pharaoh to have his part in it. And now it was simply a matter of going back, telling Jacob and bringing the whole family down. But if these brothers had a falling out and separated or schemed on how they might be able to deceive their father so they didn't have to tell the whole truth, they started to argue about these things, it might jeopardize them all getting back to Egypt with Jacob. It might mean that the brothers separated over this. It might mean that they decided not to tell Jacob the truth. We don't know. But Joseph saw the danger that disunity posed and he warned them, don't fall out on the way. Brethren, wherever God is at work among his people, and it's in a lot of places, disunity threatens that work. God could have brought the family to Egypt despite disunity, and he may have. Even if the brothers had a falling out, God could have seen it, that they all got down there, but maybe they wouldn't have. Maybe some of the brethren may have missed out on the blessing of Egypt. We just don't know. We don't know, brethren, which plans, which parts of God's plan are dependent upon our obedience. Some of them are. And regardless of the consequences, whether it's going to have a big consequence on what we miss out on in God's will, or whether God can continue his will despite our disobedience or disunity as a group, disunity is something that God hates. And I intentionally use that word. Have a look in Proverbs chapter 6. God hates disunity. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 to 19. It says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And some uh, Bible commentators see that the seventh being an abomination is God hates these six things, but the seventh, that's especially something you need to take note of. And so what are they? A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations or thinks up evil plans, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies. But what's the seventh? He that soweth discord among brethren. What does God hate? God hates it when there's discord among brethren. Well, that's not necessarily what the verse says. He that soweth discord 
among brethren. Christians are brethren, particularly those who inhabit the same local church like we do. We are brethren, all part of the family of God at work in this one place. And Christ is at work here. Christ has plans through this church that he wants to perform, and that's an exciting thing. To think that God has things that he wants this body of believers to accomplish, that he wants this body of believers to be, a testimony that he wants us to be to our community. That's an exciting thing to think that God has plans that he's going to use this body to perform. But disunity, fallouts, among the brethren hamper those grand designs that the Lord seeks to perform through his church and particularly bad are those who seek to sow discord among the brethren whether consciously or unconsciously and so Joseph's warning is pertinent to us as well see that you fall not out by the way As God has this wonderful plan for your church and as he's bringing it to pass, just make sure that you don't fall out. Satan loves a good falling out among brethren. Loves to see a part of the body crippled for a time. But what he loves even more are those who sow discord among the brethren. He loves it when people talk among the brethren about issues that they have with other believers rather than addressing those issues properly. He loves it when people spread bitterness. He loves it when people continue to bring up contentions to try and test the unity of the body of Christ. Satan loves that because it tries to go against what God is doing through a united body of Christ. Now, don't get me wrong, problems will arise. God knows that, Jesus knows that, and if we're realists, we must acknowledge that. Problems are going to come up. That's just what happens with this amount of people being all different individuals like we are and thinking in different ways. Problems will arise. Those problems need to be dealt with swiftly and spiritually. But we ought not to be people who delight in stirring up contentions. We ought not to be people who delight in reopening old wounds. We ought to be people who try and bring the body together. Now, sometimes that happens by dealing with a problem the right way. It doesn't mean just ignoring problems, but we have to deal with things the right way. Not to be someone who tries to test the consistency of the church by trying to draw it apart. The New Testament puts it this way, and I like these words, in Ephesians chapter 4. Turn over there because it's a really good way to finish. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 to 3. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Do what a person in your job should do. Walk like a Christian should. Verse 2, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Verse 3, this is where it is. Endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You see, it takes endeavour to maintain unity. That word endeavour there is is talking about your best efforts. It takes trying hard to keep the church united, to keep the unity that the Spirit has created in the bond of peace. It takes hard work. And if we don't try hard or we try and pick at old sores or we, we rejoice in bringing up contentions with other people, if we do those things, the unity will just disappear. And we'll erupt into a bickering group. (laughs) And that's just what Satan wants. And just what God hates. 
And so many of the things that God plans for us to do here will just fall by the wayside. People who should have been reached won't be. Testimonies that should have been established won't be. People who should have been loved won't be. And so as we go about fulfilling God's wonderful plans through the church, and I praise God he's got some wonderful plans for Coffs Harbour Bible Church. See that you fall not out by the way. All of us. When we consider what God wants to achieve through our church, it is no wonder that God condemns those who seek to jeopardise the unity here. And Joseph's brothers probably wouldn't have thought that their falling out was so important probably oblivious to the extent that their bickering could have affected the plan of God. But Joseph knew well enough to warn them. Knew well enough, just make sure you don't fall out on the way home. And we're glad he did. If we take time to look, we are going to see the intricate plans of the great architect. And it's a good exercise to do. He certainly has grand designs for the church at large, including this church. And so how important then for us to recognize the need to guard our unity. And this is a personal responsibility of all of us who form the family of God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful, Lord, that we can be here today. We're so thankful, Lord, that we have a body to belong to. I pray that you would help us, Lord, all to be very proactive in trying to stick ourselves together as a body. Naturally, we will come apart if we don't endeavour to keep the unity. I pray that you would help us to deal with our problems properly, help us not to just deny. But Father, we pray that you would help us to be people who seek for unity, who seek to see your wonderful plans take place here. We thank you, Lord, that you're a God who imagines great things, and Lord, we look forward to seeing those plans come to pass, even the ones we don't understand. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us, and we pray for our church in Jesus' name. Amen.